to uh, understanding that, to bring it within the compass of re representation. <coughs> uh, now, I'm not suggesting that these things necessarily should be registered, and they certainly all shouldn't all be crammed into a, a transcript. Um, but there are in instances of bodily incursions into language that pose a challenge for qualitative method. And rather than fleeing from that challenge, we could try to uh, welcome the event that that sort of data inaugurates. And equally, there seems to be sometimes a kind of method anxiety concerning the feelings and sensations that circulate in and amongst the language of research encounters. For example, when we sense humour or mockery or disgust or fascination or unease or resistance in ourselves or others. And these sensations in their queasy mixture of body and mind are problematic for any form of analysis that is looking for generalities, patterns, themes, or meanings. So conventional analysis prefers either to turn away as if these things were not happening or did not matter, or else treat them as impediments, as obstacles to the production of good data, clear ideas, or trustworthy accounts. Indeed, you could say that it's just at those moments where sensations and intensities that haunt the research scene are noticed that conventional qualitative method kicks in to diagnose and treat them as instances of bias or impression management or poor interview te technique and so on. So again, what appears to be troublesome for qualitative research is the manifestation of the body in the cerebral work of research. And you could argue that one of the main functions of method is to contain, manage or forget those bodily entanglements. So perhaps method wants its participants, both researchers and their subject, to be angels. The circle, commenting on the critique of linguistics by Deleuze and Guattari, writes that the scientific study of language needs and recognizes only angels. Speakers need no bodies, no unconscious, no social fabrication, no historical entanglements in order to function as mere emitters of signals or carriers of linguistic universals. And that is definitely Chomsky's notion. He intended his uh, grammar to um, represent the, um, the language competence of the ideal speaker here in a completely homogeneous speech community. Uh, okay, so Le Circle elaborates, and this is the quote that I really like. The reduction of the speaker to an angel and of the situation of communication to a polite conversation between angels in heaven inevitably turns long into a normal, what Deleuze and Guattari call a standard form of language. Angels do not speak dialects, they do not have a social or regional accent or lexicon, and heaven being a place of unspeakable boredom, much in need of a serpent to make it interesting, angels are no poets in spite of their lyres. Uh, so we need to uh, tangle with the materiality of language if we are to avoid recreating the boring, bloodless, most definitely not vomiting angels conjured in traditional linguistics and qualitative research. And I should point out in passing that Le Circle's, critique, uh, Le Circle's angels are clearly a different species from the transgressive, perplexing uh, enunciators of postmodernity that Patty Lather and Chris Smithies wrote about so powerfully in their book Troubling the Angels. And I wouldn't want to denigrate the power of the angel as a productive figure for postmodernity, but I merely note here, as Milton wrote many years ago, that uh, angels may play for more than one side. So in the logic of sense, uh, Deleuze often discusses the body language duality in terms of eating and speaking, things or propositions to eat or to speak. And this invokes the essential orality of language. It's lodging in the mouth where speaking and eating happen. It's emphatically material language. It issues from the depths of the body, comes through our, you know, from the palate and the moist air of the lungs. Uh, and in, uh, but as the incorporeal stuff of propositional meaning, it's also ideational. And uh, language, according to Deleuze, um, the logic of sense articulates these two series, bodies and propositions, things and words, bringing their depths together uh, and, uh, and their heights on the virtual surface. As uh, Lisa said yesterday, quoting Deleuze, co uh, talking about Alice in Wonderland, um, everything happens at the border. And this articulation, according to Deleuze, is enabled when something paradoxical and nonsensical travels along the two series of bodies and propositions, eating and speaking, causing them to resonate. resonate. So sounds belong to both language and to bodies, but something needs to happen to transform those bodily noises into elements of the linguistic system. Otherwise, 
he says, we'll be stuck in the uh, dilemma of the uh, schizophrenic who is trapped in the depths of the body where language and pieces of objects puncture and wound. So uh, Deleuze says, to render language possible thus signifies that assuring that sounds are not confused with the sonorous qualities of, thing, qualities of things, with the sound effects of bodies, or with their, uh, or their actions and passions. What renders language possible is that which separates sounds from bodies and organises them into propositions, freeing them for the expressive function. It's always a mouth which speaks, but the sound is no longer the noise of a body which eats, a pure orality in order to become the manifestation of a subject expressing itself. So language is only possible when sound enters a new relation with bodies. And this happens, Deleuze writes, when something traces a line that becomes a frontier between the body and language, things and propositions, something that nevertheless doesn't exist apart from the proposition that expresses it or the body from which it issues. This something that is, that is nothing is sense or the pure event. Sense and the event are superficial, they're of the surface, so we must avoid the airy inefficacy of the bloodless angels that inhabit the heights of scientific rationality, but we must also, as Deleuze cautions, avoid the abject allure of depth where schizophrenic, the schizophrenic is endlessly trapped. Okay, so Deleuze says, depth is no longer a compliment. Only animals are deep, and they are not the noblest for that. The noblest are the flat animals, and this is in logic of sense written under the influence of Lewis Carroll and Alice's adventures, as Lisa told us. Deleuze locates the logic of sense not in the underground layer, but in Alice's climb to the, to the surface, and her transversal movements across the flat terrains of the looking glass and the chessboard, and, and her encounter with the depthless, depthless figures of the playing cards. So, qualitative inquiry might stop looking for depth and hoping for height. We might work instead with and within the flat topology of events, which, according to Deleuze, and to return to my opening quote, are like crystals. They become and grow only out of the edges or on the edge. An analysis, if we still want to call it that, might be a matter of alertness to the Mobius strip of sense and nonsense that runs through Deleuze's two primary series of bodies and language and focus on those instances where that frontier line between the two can almost be glimpsed as it rises to the surface. <coughs> Hannah's silence and the vomiting child mentioned above are two such events. Others have been there already, of course. Deleuze found many instances in Lewis Carroll, including the gardener's song in Carroll's late work, Sylvie and Bruno, whose stanzas crop up intermittently throughout the tale, always uh, bringing together, um, cutting together and cutting apart, if you like, in that phrase, to the two heterogeneous series one of which comprises bodies or objects that eat or can be eaten and, the other, uh, and have a decisive physicality, and the other composed of symbolic and linguistic entities. So those two um, series are brought together in the gardener's song. And at the end of the st each stanza, the gardener, says Deleuze, draws a melancholic path between the two series. For this song, Deleuze writes, is its own story. And here's just one stanza. He thought he saw an elephant that practised on a fife. He looked again and found it was a letter from his wife. At length I realise, he said, the bitterness of life. How true. Uh, and I recently wrote in Jessica and Becky's book of some other uh, examples of where uh, things together uh, come together from the body and the language, but I think I'm not going to pause on them now. Um, I think I will just say that if, once you start to think about the entanglement of bodies and language, you actually do notice it everywhere. It's a bit like the refrain of it, and it probably is in some sense the refrain. Um, <coughs> for instance, I mean, just thinking of things where places I've re recognised it recently, uh, you can see in Eve Sedgwick's marvellous essay called A Poem is Being Written, which echoes Freud's famous um, uh, text, A Child is Being Bitten, uh, not bitten, eaten. Uh, which interferes, <coughs> Freudian, yes, <laughs> exactly. Sedgwick's poem, a uh, text, interferes with the angelic separation of words and events to unfold a connection which is both deeply personal and flamboyantly literary uh, between the poetic device called enjambement, which is the carrying over or withholding of the completion of a line, with spanking. When I was a little child, she recalls, the two most rhythmic, rhythmic things that happened to me were spanking and poetry. And, I mean, I can commend this. It's, you know, there is much more to 
deeper um, paper than this, but again, it's working through that notion that you know, language is not this indifferent, impersonal thing, but that bodies and uh, uh, rhythms from both series may resonate. And of course, it has been everywhere this week also, that perplexing mixture of bodies and languages, the perplex perplexing, but also energizing and ultimately quite thrilling. So we saw it in uh, Alison and Takawa uh showing this week of the mixture of body, breath, and voice, and noise, and sweat in the haka for the returning uh, dead soldiers. And it's also in Alicia's um, <coughs> clips that she showed of the Dallas cheerleaders and the auto-tuned performance. So in place of the incorporeal angel, or the stolid corporeality of the animal, Deleuze commends the stammerer, and here finally I've got round to it, a figure who must slide and lurch from one resting point on the surface of language to the next. Back where we started, but hopefully different. The first secret of the stammerer, no longer to sink, but to slide the whole length in such a way that the old depth no longer exists at all, having been reduced to the other side of the surface. The stutter is the point at which ordinary language fails, representation is momentarily brought to a standstill, and the materiality of language, its lodging in the body, prevails. Caught in an impasse where the usually smooth passage from the depths of the body to the incorporeality of ideas is short-circuited, the stammerer has to make that lateral slide to lurch from one moment to another along the length of the Mobius strip. The circler, writing of Deleuze's writing about style in Beckett, says, creative stuttering is what makes language grow from middle, like grass. It's what makes language a rhizome instead of a tree, what puts language in perpetual disequilibrium. Stuttering as style, says Le Circle, is what, I quote, makes you a stranger in your own language that opens up for you, as speaker or writer, the lines of flight that will allow thought to visit your utterance. I think we've only just we're only just beginning to glimpse what it would mean to do that kind of creative stuttering. But I do think we've seen instances of it this week in the examples I've given, and also, of course, the wonderful musical stuttering into the near future of the performance by Dividual Machine in their improvisations this week. But of course, as Betty said, <coughs> and we're cycling right back again to the start, it's difficult not to sink into the old habits of humanism and hubris that promise some kind of depleted mastery over the world through the dogmatic exercise of methodological good sense and common sense. Part of the reason why qualitative research tends to collapse back into such positions is, I suspect, associated with our failure to engage fully with the material, materiality of language and its challenge to the workings of representation. And to end, I'm going to just play you a little clip, which I'm sorry, I can't stop playing, but people can't stop watching either because it's a YouTube clip. But I think it says something very non-propositional about um, the emergence of language from rhythm and affect and sound and noise and can manifest a sense even when there are not yet propositions. So let's have a look. Didn't want to stop. Yeah. <coughs> Oh, we've got a wonderfully relevant advert there. Just bear with me. <laughs> it's actually rather good. She's calling me. The baby's time to sleep. But I'm off to that. How relevant. See, the royal baby got back in at the end anyway. But who knew? This is the clip.
Okay, it goes on, and it is strangely fascinating, and something rather Beckett-like about it as well, actually. I don't know, and I think there is refrain in there and all sorts of things. But I'm just going to leave that to resonate and conclude now. Here ends. Yes, we absolutely are, and that was uh, old Cartesian habits and uh, lack of thought um, on the part of the organisers, i.e. <laughs> uh, about, precisely about, um, you know, the fact that bodies uh, uh, and language and propositions are not separate and that we could do more interesting things. And I have to say that uh, in the um, uh, event that uh, Hillevy organised in Stockholm uh, a month or so ago, uh, she and Anna and Lisa and their helpers were much more attentive to those um, uh, fixings and we did lots of interesting things like um, having walks in twos around the lake and uh, doing other bodily stuff like that. Now, we can't go for walks here, or actually we could have this, this time, but I would have had to provide ordinarily 150 umbrellas. But, you know, I, I do take your point and I think, you know, maybe if we continue conversations about this, we could actually address that and stop you know, alluding to the problem of representation while being representation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think um, Kelly's, is Kelly here? Hello Kelly. <coughs> I forgot, she's amongst the good girls at the front. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think you actually, um, in your uh, um, presentation, did actually um, a much more serious and, uh, and yet entertaining attempt to, to do that, didn't you? I mean, you were trying to escape the kind of the fetters of propositional language. Stand up. <laughs> No, 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 I was just going to say, you, uh, people might want to hear you, you might. Oh, well, um, it's a confession. So had I been scheduled for Monday, it actually would have been perhaps even more experimental. Um, but as I heard and watched and sensed what the Institute was about, I got a little bit um, intimidated by the possibility of being too performative. And so backed off of that a little bit um, and tried to find some milk. That's a real shame, isn't it? I mean, it's our, it's our shame, not yours. You know, that, that, that would be the way it, it was experienced. Thank you, Kelly. Anyone else? Erica. Erica saying she arrived late. Sorry, it's difficult for people I to hear. I arrived late in the, well, go to your talk, sorry. Um, <laughs> Oh, please. You know, the irresistibility of it. Yes. Um, and, and of course, it does exemplify the, you know, the points about language and communication or uh, more than communication and less that, that, that you're describing. But um, as, you know, as a critical developmental psychologist or anti developmental psychologist or whatever, how, I, mean, I suppose I want to pose the question to you and to all of us. Uh, you know, it's not insignificant to turn to an example from, from child development. Yes. Or, yeah. or, or if you're not going to call it infant development, then infancy. Yes. You know, that always threatens to catapult us back into that genealogical narrative. Yes. So um, I think but it's, it has seemed to me that the challenge for us is to find examples in other arenas that do this kind of work too. Mm -hmm. Whether it's about the, the, you know, the, 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 the forms of non-representational uh, communicative characteristics of, of people in other states, I've also been thinking about speech therapy. Actually, oh, right. Like, speech 
that would be an interesting and I, I place to go. Delusian <laughs> speech therapy would be great. Do you want to say just a little bit more about what you see as the um, the problem of always going to um, children and childhood for these examples? Um, I'll try to. Yes, because it I know, it's, it's impossible, you know, yeah. it leads to no, silence, no, no, I'm not in a good way. No, 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 of course not. I would agree with that in general. Although I think there's also a case for examples that themselves kind of challenge that. Although I admit there's huge discursive yeah. work to be done. But I mean, one of the things I particularly liked about this clip, I guess, because again, having been kind of um, bred up in uh, Chomsky and, and psycholinguistics and other forms, you know, a, a lot of child development really makes a huge thing of you know the first word, the one word stage, all of that. And I thought, I feel this one also kind of. Um, invokes the, the fact that the collective murmur pre-exists us because what these babies are doing is not like coming from nowhere, is it? You know, there is some something about language is happening in and through them. Yeah. But I do take the point about, you know, we need to look in Well I, I agree with you that there's a lot of non developmental stuff going on in what is reported to be yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, one more and then we'll Sarah. That's a great example, Vicky Kirby, yeah. about the lightning. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, well, uh, I suggest that for the last discussion session of the week, you go and uh, discuss, and then um, we'll have tea and coffee, and then we'll come back, and I'll try to keep it, you know, uh, lightened. <laughs> <laughs> not too taxing, but just kind of, I'm not going to try and summarise the week or have you do it, but we'll just kind of round up and think of what's next. That's the main thing. So, thank you, folks.